Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to continue our look at the Spanish influenza epidemic of 1918 to 1919. Now the United States declared war on Germany in April 1917 and started a draft of eligible young men in June of 1917. By the time Dr. Loring Minor made the first reports of what appears to be the earliest cases of Spanish influenza in Haskell County in mid-February 1918, that draft was well underway. Young men from Haskell County were either drafted or volunteered for service in the Army and reported to Camp Funston, which is near what is now present-day Fort Riley in Kansas. And this was the first week of March 1918. Now we saw in our first episode that a cook in that camp by the name of Mitchell reported to sick call on the morning of March 4th with severe flu symptoms. There was another soldier right on his heels with similar symptoms, and by noon over 100 men were hospitalized at Camp Funston with symptoms of the flu. So let's cue up the music and pick up the story from there. The type of influenza that causes pandemics and is also responsible for seasonal influenza is a type A influenza. Now the reservoir for type A influenza is in general birds. Now the influenza that is found in these birds can be transmitted to other animals, specifically things like pigs and people. Now there are other species that can receive this avian flu, such as dogs, cats, horses, etc. But we're going to talk about mostly birds to pigs to people. Now the next thing that I want to go over is how do we actually name the flu? There's an actual system for this, and there's a very good presentation by the Khan Academy linked in the description that goes over this in detail. Let me just kind of gloss over it real quick. Now, an influenza A virus is an RNA virus. There are eight strands of RNA within the viral particle itself. On the surface of the particle, we have things called glycoproteins, and there are two that we're interested in. The first is a hemagglutin protein. And what the hemagglutin does, it allows the virus to enter into the cell. It helps it break into a cell. Now, once the virus is in the cell wall, it takes over the machinery of the cell and makes more copies of itself. This is how it reproduces. Now, the next problem that it has is it's got to somehow get out of the cell and infect other cells in the system. The way that it does that is using another glycoprotein on the surface of the virus called neuraminidase. And what that does is that causes the cell wall to break and allows the virus to escape and infect other cells. Now these two glycoproteins form the basis of how we name an influenza virus. There are 10 different types of neuraminidase. So you can have N1, N2, N3, all the way up to N10. And there are 17 different types of hemagglutins. So you can have H1, H2, etc., up to 17. So the first thing that we do to name a virus is we note what kind of glycoproteins are on the surface. So we can have, for example, H1, N1. That means that it has the first hemagglutin and it has the first neuroaminidase. Now the next thing that we do with flu viruses is we like to kind of make a note of where the virus was first described or where it came from. So we can have things like Asia and Hong Kong and Spain. Now a couple of quick points. If you have an influenza A virus that is designated H1N1, that does not necessarily mean that they are the same virus because the H1N1 just refers to the stuff that's on the surface of the virus. The RNA that's within the virus can also modify the infection as well. For example, the Spanish flu was an H1N1 influenza virus, but the RNA of the virus particle itself gave it some different characteristics. For example, there was a hemorrhagic component. Your eyes and your lungs would bleed with the Spanish flu. Now the H1N1 influenza that killed my friend in 2010 had the same H1N1 designation as the Spanish flu did. However, it didn't have the hemorrhagic component to it. 
the RNA of the virus itself was a little bit different. The other thing that I want to mention is that certain combinations of the H and the N component are more successful in infecting people than others. For example, H1N1 is a very common cause of influenza in people. In the 1950s, H2N2 was also a significant cause of disease. However, due to vaccinations and the genetic changes in the H2N2 influenza, H3N3 became more common and H2N2 seemed to kind of decline. Now here's a table of the viral types of major flu pandemics that have occurred in the world since about 1900. Now, the Spanish influenza was an H1N1 influenza. When my mother was at the University of Michigan in the late 1950s, they had an epidemic of something called Asian flu, and that was an H2N2 influenza. In 1968, we had the Hong Kong flu, which was H3N2 influenza. So you see the drift there, and then the H1N1 influenza continues to cause us problems. Now I'll do another episode sometime on influenza viruses, including B and C influenza, but that's for another time. If you would like to get some more information on influenza A, go ahead and have a look at this Khan Academy video and it'll answer a lot of your questions. Now H1N1 influenza is a very common cause of disease in man. It's the cause of seasonal flu. It's normally a pretty self-limited disease, has a mortality rate of about 0.1%. What was special about the H1N1 influenza? Now there are two basic ways that we get new strains of flu. First of all, we can have, for example, an H1N1 influenza that undergoes a mutation to become a more virulent strain, but it's still an H1N1 influenza because it has the same glycoproteins on the outside. So we have a run-of-the-mill normal seasonal flu H1N1 influenza, and then we get a new form of H1N1 influenza that we call a novel H1N1. Now that novel virus may be a particularly virulent virus and cause a widespread epidemic, or it may just be another seasonal flu. Now the second way that viruses mutate is a little bit more complex. Say we have a bird that has an influenza A that infects a pig. Now a human being who also has influenza can infect the same pig. And as a result of having this infection within the one animal, these glycoproteins can get switched around a little bit, as we see up here. Now at the top, we have a human influenza of the type H2N2. And that has to do with these glycoproteins on the surface of the virus, the hemagglutin and the neuraminidase. This is an avian influenza virus of the type H3N8. Notice that it has different types of glycoproteins on the surface, but the inside is pretty much the same. Now, what happens is a human influenza virus will get into a pig and a bird influenza virus will get into the same pig. And as a result, these glycoproteins are exchanged. Notice that they're different from this one and they're different from this one. And this becomes a new influenza strain. And in this particular case, it's named H3N2. It gets the H3 from the avian influenza, and then it gets the N2 from the human influenza. And this is a completely different strain than either of these. Now, the second way that an influenza virus can mutate is just a direct mutation of the virus itself. So once again, after the men from Haskell County reported to Cap Funston at the end of February, 1918, we had Albert Mitchell, a company cook, report the sick call in the morning of March 4th. Immediately after that was Corporal Lee Drake, and by noon, 100 men were admitted to the hospital with the flu. Within two to three weeks, the entire 1,100-bed hospital was full of flu cases, and there were thousands more sick in the barracks. Now, to give you an example, a soldier at Camp Funston reported that in his 12-man room, seven of the men had the flu. Now, when I went into the Army in 1984, I did my initial basic training 
at Fort Jackson in South Carolina. I then immediately traveled from Fort Jackson to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas for my AIT, my advanced training. And within the next few months, I was at Fort Gordon, I was at Fort Leonard Wood, I was at Camp Custer, and I was at Fort Lewis, Washington. The point is that the Army moves people around for training. Their training is very compartmentalized. Now, the same thing happened in 1918. And within a few weeks, there were cases of influenza at 24 of the 36 main camps in the United States. Now, this initial wave of flu was not that bad. It was described as a three-day fever. Of the thousands of men at Camp Funston that were sick, there were only about 50 deaths. The majority of the soldiers recovered. However, from Camp Funston and the other infected camps, they traveled by train through small towns along the way to the major ports like New York City. All along these trips, the trains would stop frequently and the soldiers would get off to get fresh air. This exposed the railroad workers and the townspeople all along the railroad lines. Then the men went on to troop ships where they were crammed in like sardines. Their bunks were stacked four to six high for the long trip to Europe. When they landed at Brest, another influenza epidemic broke out. The men were then transferred to the front lines in France, where they lived in close quarters in the mud of the trenches. The three-day fever ran rampant. As these men were taken prisoner, they transferred this disease to the German army, who in turn transferred it to the German population. As casualties were evacuated to Great Britain, the flu went with them and it got into the British population as well. In May and June of 1918, the British Grand Fleet reported 10,313 people sick with the flu and four deaths. In May of that year, the flu made it to Italy and then on to North Africa. Now, while both the Allies and the Central Powers had restrictions on the press preventing them from reporting any bad news that might interfere with the war effort, neutral Spain had no such restrictions. The influenza was widely reported in Spain and Portugal, especially when the King of Spain developed influenza. And as a result, people began to call this the Spanish flu. Now, the epidemic continued to grow. By June, it reached Asia. By July, it reached Scandinavia and Russia. In India and West Africa, the local epidemic would start in a port city brought there by sailors and then it would spread inland. This is very similar to what we're seeing with COVID-19 right now, which seems to be centered around major airline hubs, Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta. Looking at the map of cases here in my state of Michigan, you'll see that they are centered down by Detroit Metro Airport and extend outward from there. Now, by July, they began to get a break. The epidemic seemed to be petering out as the virus was running out of fresh people to infect. The first reports of this Spanish flu came out in the Washington newspapers in August of 1918. Prior to that, it had only been mentioned in internal reports, and those reports only went back to about April. The world breathed a sigh of relief. However, the virus mutated, and the second wave of the Spanish influenza was by far the most deadly it ranked up there with the Black Death from the Middle Ages of Europe. And that's what we'll talk about in our next episode. So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy, signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for your support of this channel. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button down there before you leave. See you again soon.